Hello, everybody. My name is Eric Hines. I'm curator of Film Museum of the Moving Image. Welcome to the Reverse Shot Happy Hour for October 30th, 2020. If you're joining us live, welcome. If you're joining us later on uh, via YouTube, thanks for finding us there. Uh, I want to thank you from Museum of the Moving Image for your continued support during this prolonged time outside of the museum and outside of theaters. Uh, and uh, we have an ongoing Kickstarter uh, campaign that has just a little bit left in it. Uh, so please find us there if you want to support the happy hour and if you want to support what we're doing at the museum going forward. Um, as you know, if you tuned in last week or previous weeks, we do have, we are part of a drive-in in, in Queens, New York uh, with Rooftop Films and New York Hall of Science located at New York Hall of Science. And we've had uh, nearly a week already of a Halloween themed movies and tonight we have a double feature of Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Halloween and tomorrow we have an all ages uh, dress up your car uh, <laughs> event a double feature of uh, Beetlejuice and Little Shop of Horrors so we're going to end up in style. Uh, thanks for for again for coming out if you have been able to and I want to put in one quick plug before we start the program for another program tonight that actually begins in a few hours 9 p.m. Eastern and 6 p.m. Pacific, which is uh, our friends at the Northwest Film Center are put together a spectral transmission ghost story radio show with our very, very dear friends, Donald Mosher and Michael Palmieri and they put together a really amazing hour um, with uh, collaborators and some other fellow travelers of ours, folks that we've had at the museum here in the drive in uh, museum is also um, at the happy hour Maya Daisy Hawk, Sierra Pettengill and Jeannie Finley among others. So please tune into that this evening if you're around. Um, and if you are around uh, with the wheels and you're in New York, come and find us at the drive-in. Otherwise, let's get to the program. Uh, this week, uh, we have uh, a, a, a quite an ambitious program with several guests that we'll hear about in a moment. And to get us there are the hosts of the Reverse Shot Happy Hour, the editors and founders of Reverse Shot, Michael Koreski and Jeff Reichert, and longtime contributor and filmmaker, Free Hazaman. Hi, friends. Hello. Hey, Eric. Hello. Really, really quiet. You're all very incredibly quiet. And We're trying to creep creep. you out. <laughs> you can't creep a creeper. Can't creep a creeper. I've already, I'm blinded by this light, so I can't see a thing. <laughs> all right, friends. Have some fun. I'll see you in a little bit. Bye, Eric. Or will we? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, would, would you be okay if I if I just do this the entire hour? I think it works for you. Thank I you. think you're the you're you're leading introductions today, so maybe your skull behind you can uh, do a little marionette routine. I call this the Harlequin Demon. He has and he has no name. Jeff, does your costume have a concept? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Paper anniversary. Yeah, my concept is a weird thing I made. And what about uh, you, Eva? Well, mine started with uh, the only thing left in the Halloween makeup kit that I, uh, for some reason, always have year round is blood. Um, but I've found a container, which is um, because my the, the candle I've lit happens to be called Love Potion, and I poured myself a little tequila and blood beverage. So I'm thinking of it as uh angsty teenage vampire cries tears of blood over unrequited love <laughs> especially very melancholy but halloween is a melancholy time maybe i i i did i just smeared the blood first and uh discovered the theme later as is often the it's a great allegory for the critical process wouldn't you say yeah sometimes you need to just figure it out through the process yeah lay down lay down the creative work I feel like Jeff's mask, which he made himself, in case anyone was was wondering if it was professional, um, it just reminds me of like a very low rent leather face. I have to say, <laughs> which is scarier somehow. It, despite being uh, not, despite not looking like it's made out of human flesh, it actually terrifies me more. Yeah, I mean, are you going to keep that on the whole time, Jeff? We'll see. I mean, the thing about it is, it actually is made of human flesh. Oh, okay. I guess we were wrong. I wish it had your beard, your old beard. It's quite comfortable, in fact, because it just kind of it bends to my face. I rewatched the Texas Chainsaw Massacre this week. Um, it's a film I've seen many times, and I always think that I'm going to be somehow 
over its thrills or immune to its terrors. And I, so I popped it on like any, any, any smart person does at midnight by himself on the couch. And I was freaked out all over again. I mean, it truly upset me. And then I had to go to bed. And it was a really bad idea, but a fantastic movie, a masterpiece, if you will. I was looking at this uh, study recently because in preparation for our uh, theme this week, I was like, oh, what do, what do all those internet listicles say are the scariest movies? And you know, we see a lot of the same titles over and over and some of them are classics for a reason, but I came across this um, uh, sort of scientific study of what the most scary horror movies are oh, in a Forbes a article. Right. Hmm. Well, I used, I used air quotes for a reason. They even sort of um, qualify what the caveats are in the article. I'm gonna find it in a second and share. But it was interesting because the whole top 10 were um, all recent films. I think the number one was like sinister or something. And I was like, is that just because when you try to use some sort of measure in, of, of your physiological response uh, and some evidence of fear, it's totally based in jump scares and how your heart rate changes and that's just not as measurable in something that has a slow burn creep you out stick under your skin forever kind of feeling and those are the films that scare me much more as soon as i'm out of a sinister i never think about it again you know so i was curious about yeah is it it does it have to do with what they're able to measure physically and like the measure of fear is actually really challenging. Is it just weighted towards more contemporary films? Um, or am I just being biased about the films that I saw and that freaked me out when I was just a young and an actual teen vampire like Texas Chainsaw? These are very good questions. And I'm hoping that the guests today will help us answer some of them because I don't think that there is any metric you can point to to say this is scientifically the scariest movie because it's obviously incredibly subjective. But then what's interesting are, are these, you know, case studies. I'm, I'm always fascinated. It's one of my favorite topics, actually. I'm always fascinated to hear what scares people because what scares me might not be the same as what scares you. And in fact, you know, the topic today is what is your scariest movie? And I'm pretty sure that one of mine, or maybe the movie that has scared me or upset me the most is probably not going to be someone else's pick, but I'm excited to, uh, to find out. Well, and I love that anytime they, there is an attempted scientific study, it's like immediately comically reductive. Right. It's not like every time your pulse quickens. It's like how lie detector tests are not really that accurate. But I do like the idea. Of that. <laughs> well, I, I, dropped... I, I would like to be hooked up to some machine <laughs> while I watch The Shining or something and see what happens. Yeah. I want a map of my, <laughs> I want a blown up like a uh, chart of what my brain does watching The Shining. Jeff is shaking his terrifying head because he's very <laughs> scared of The Shining, we should say. Jeff has, has had very bad experiences watching The Shining. I mean, I've only really had one experience watching The Shining, which is <laughs> the first time I saw it, I cried because I was so terrified. <laughs> this is as an adult. This is as an adult. I was like a 25-year-old man. <laughs> I brought up a story about The Shining that is not fear-related that I'll... I'll uh, reiterate briefly which is I tried to show it at my like I think my 12th birthday slumber party <laughs> and uh, a couple of my friends were like not quite ready for that much rotting nudity I guess and I told them to grow up it's <laughs> actually like, pretty sexy it's a movie grow up um slumber party episode also coming up let's we'll say but before we get too deep into it, we want to invite all of our amazing guests into the room to talk about this for our special Halloween happy hour. So I'm just gonna go one by one, and if I get something wrong, please reach through that screen and slap me across the face. Um, let's start with Ina Archer, who is, uh, and she's in everything, but she's an <laughs> artist and a media conservator. And I think she will appear, hi, hi Ina. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm just going out the back. You're, you're muted, Dinah. We're, we'll go right into Beatrice Loiza, critic, who's now a werewolf. Ooh. Welcome. Oh. Ooh, Beatrice. Yes. Critic Adam Naiman, longtime reverse shot contributor and um, author of the new book, Paul Thomas Anderson Masterworks, which is a beautiful masterwork. Oh, in Hey, Adam. And Nicholas Russell, critic and author. 
coming all the way from Vegas, materializing out of the mist from Vegas. Hi guys. Hey Nicholas. Hi. Welcome. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for having us. I mean, you got to do something for Halloween this year, right? I mean, do people <laughs> have plans? I mean, are, are we doing anything other than looking at screens this year? <laughs> I guess not. Luck luckily, <laughs> the mood setting of movie watching and reading scary stories has always been an important part of Halloween for me. So I feel like I'm missing just one element and not the only element of a successful Halloween. And this Halloween, there's a, uh, in the Western Hemisphere, there's a, a full moon on Saturday. Oh yeah. Halloween yeah. night. Uh, I hear that witches around America are very excited. And there's, <laughs> if you wanna look into their activities, go to Instagram and look up hashtag bind Trump. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is the, the perfect Halloween of, of my youth, like a full moon Saturday. The weather's pretty good. You could wear a good costume without having to wear a coat. So it's, uh, I'm, you know, I think this is the first year I haven't actually tried to make any kind of costume, but uh, I think that that's kind of a bummer. <laughs> but trick or, trick or treating is not really. It. Trick or treating is not really allowed in Toronto, but we're going to take our daughter out for a walk so she can at least see the houses and the decorations and stuff. So that'll be fun. That'll be nice. I am. I, I've said this before about some things during COVID era, but for for an antisocial, slightly antisocial person who tends to just want to be at home in front of the TV, this is you know, <laughs> this is an okay <laughs> holiday compromise to me. <laughs> Even without, um, even without being a parent, I, I uh, echo Adam's general uh, tactic of being in the streets <laughs> and like just feeling the Halloween vibes. There's some good Brooklyn streets where you may be distanced and there's like a secret Diker Heights of Halloween where the houses on that strip just go all out. Look it up. It's very true. Um, so let's get into it. I want to know what terrifies everybody. But we're going to go, we'll go one by one at first, because I, I think everybody should have actually brought, because we, we asked you to prepare with perhaps your scariest film. There are ways of defining this. There are ways of qualifying this. There, there are things that scared you when you were a child. There are things that scared you, that scare you now, and that might have changed over the years. But just to get going, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with Ina again, because <laughs> I'm going in the order of my screen. It doesn't matter what other people think <laughs> like. I, I, I have, I'm, I'm running the seance. I know what is, okay. what came to mind first when you were asked what your scariest film is? <laughs> well, first, and I just have to apologize for my lack of scary atmosphere because my beautiful sunlight coming in is just, you know, golden hour, but it will soon become darker. But <laughs> the first one that I uh, came to mind was, you may have guessed, Michael, The Vanishing. <gasps> oh, such a good much. pick <laughs> and uh the only reason that i didn't pick it as my my one that i want to talk about is that it's kind of a bummer but <laughs> it is the movie i think that scares me the most it's the scariest movie uh that i've encountered and you know many came to mind but that would be my very first one that popped into my mind so, so um, tell us a little bit about the vanishing for those who haven't seen it but also without spoiling the thing about the vanishing. Uh, that's a, okay, that's a hard assignment. That's, that's scary hard. right there. Um, Do not is, watch before a road trip. <laughs> oh, right, no. yes, I can never go to, uh, <laughs> to a rest stop ever again. Um, it is, I, I don't know the date of the film. Of course, I didn't uh, refresh because um, uh, I wasn't going to talk about it, but it um, it was um, adapted from a novella. Um, it's about a couple who are going on a trip together. Um, on their trip, they uh, stop or get stuck in a tunnel where they have a, a, a discussion about, um, basically about their fears. And the woman expresses uh, a, a dream that she had about being um, in a golden egg. Um, they continue on their trip, um, which has a little bit of tensions in it. Uh, they stop at a, um, a rest stop and she vanishes. Um, and the rest of the film that spans um, 
a short time that that's the short time that it takes for the uh the husband to um realize that she's gone and then trying to figure out you know where she is at that period of time and then it takes time um in, over the years where he is obsessively trying to find out what happened to what happened to her um parallel to this is the story of a uh i don't remember if he's a scholar or a uh well but a figure who is very interested in um uh, psychological challenges mm -hmm. and is how these two um, end up cross over. Um, and it's has one of the most overall frightening um, uh, confrontations that we could have with ourselves. I guess I'll put it that way. Mm. That's very, but I think that um, is such a terrifying film that has such a profound effect on anyone who's seen it that I believe someone else that I've just discovered, someone else in our in our um, seance tonight may have also selected it. Am I right? Oh, reveal are you yourself. Are you asking me? <laughs> yeah, that, that, that would have been. I was, I was wondering. <laughs> oh, good. So then you can. So you can give a better. Uh, well, you, you use the phrase confrontation with the self. And I was kind of thinking when I was coming here, it was going to be a movie like that. Because when I think with the scariest movies, I was looking back through the pumpkin. Because I wrote about vanishing as a pumpkin for Michael years ago. And I was looking at the other ones I wrote about or some of the best entries. And I was like, even if it's not a horror movie, that's what Le Jeté is about. And that's one of the reasons that I find, you know, the vanishing so scary, which is that it's just a sort of drive towards death. Like the narrative is sort of incidental. It's a really scary plot and very realistic. And the the adaptation of the, the novel, The Golden Egg is really faithful. Or if you read the story, it's like really very similar, but it's just mostly the inevitability that, um, you know, if you follow your impulses or follow your desires to their logical conclusion, they're kind of self-destructive. So the backup movie that I had, because I was like, well, if someone picks The Vanishing, I have to have a backup movie. It was another one I, <laughs> another one I did as a, as a pumpkin that's got an even more explicit confrontation with the self moment that is one of the scariest things I've ever seen in a movie. Even if it's not the scariest movie I've seen, it's one of the best moments in any horror movie, which is Joel Anderson's film Lake Mungo from 2008, wow. which is one of the found footage horror movies that actually ennobles the form like oh. really kind of uses it well and has a moment that's just absolutely awful. And it's not awful in terms of extremity or gore. It's just the implications of it and the way it's folded into the movie's design. It's the one unexplainable moment in a movie where otherwise everything is kind of, you can kind of rationalize it or you can kind of justify why the camera is seeing certain things. Yeah. It's just such a frightening moment because this movie has accounted for everything that we've seen or thought we've seen or that's been faked within the found footage conceit. And then this moment is completely inscrutable and completely destabilizing and recontextualizes the movie before it. And I love horror movies and Mike and I have spent years talking about the horror movies we like and that idea of sadness too in horror. And Lake Mungo is just a profoundly sad, melancholy movie whose main character earns her surname. This is a character about a girl whose last name is Palmer. And I think the David Lynch Twin Peaks illusion is pretty mm. significant given the plot of the film. Like the highest compliment I can give a horror movie is that it it lives up to aspects of Firewalk with me. And it's a movie that I hope anyone <laughs> watching this, if they haven't seen it, you know, will seek out because it's actually semi kind of obscure. Like it is a bit of a buried movie. And it, it, it deserves a lot better than it got. Um, I'm going to interject because I believe the, I don't, we did not prepare for this, everyone who's watching, but it seems like every time someone mentions a film, the next person had their selection already selected. <laughs> um, it's a chain of horror. I just want to say <laughs> that I'm glad that it's being brought up potentially multiple times today. I watched it last week with, um, with my husband and it gave that moment that I believe you're talking about. There are a lot of shivery moments in that film, but I believe the moment, the one that was actually, it's on the cell phone footage, if that's, I got one of those full body shivers, like completely up the spine, 
complete like full body tingling. And I was trying to think what are all the movies that have actually done that to me in that moment did that for me. But um, Nicholas, it's I, I believe from something that you just <laughs> said that your choice has been taken. Well, so. Not taken, shared. Shared, yeah. I think yeah. like I was, <laughs> I was trying to think about if I was gonna say like Mungo, if only because I, I've written about it before. So I felt like that was kind of cheating. Um, but I also have another one, which I was, I rewatched it uh, earlier this week pretty convinced that I wouldn't think it was scary anymore. It's also a found footage movie. And it's a found footage movie no one really talk talks about um, because the franchise it belongs to is not great. Um, mm. But I think for like really smart scares that have like nothing to do with the jump scare, uh, Paranormal Activity 3 is like, <laughs> is like truly underrated. It's so stupid, but it's like, I feel like me and my me and my really good friend talk about this all the time. We think that like a really good horror movie has to have something like kind of silly about it in order to make the other stuff really scary, which is why we like The Conjuring so much because like mm. The Conjuring movies are like have terrible acting and the scares are like really scary. And like, then the acting takes you out of it and you're like, oh, that's nice. And then like something really scary happens again. And I feel like Paranormal Activity 3, because it's the prequel to the first two movies, it's set in the 80s, 90s. And it like, it does the thing that a lot of found footage movies do, which I find really annoying, which is like, they like, they have to give you a reason as to why there are cameras in all these different places. And it's like, <laughs> mm -hmm. whatever, like, okay, we get it. Like they did that with like the Blair Witch like reboot or whatever, where it's like, we have like drones, which is why we can show you all these things. And it's like, okay, whatever, like, I don't care. But there are some, like one of my favorite scares and I think about it all the time and it's so simple. I, I, I appreciate like really simple, like construction when it comes to horror movies. It's like, they set up a camera on like what was like a fan, so it went like it right, the oscillating fan. I was wondering if this was the one with the oscillating fan. I was yeah. Th there's some really good like the way that the directors play with the fact that like you already know that there's like a demon there, and like, like <laughs> the demon as such is like is kind of playful and kind of funny, and like and then there are parts where it's really not anymore, and so like there's a babysitter. And like the camera's panning back and forth. She's sitting in the um, the kitchen, pans over, whatever, pans away. When it pan pans back, it looks like there's a little kid with a sheet over them that's standing behind her. And then as soon as the camera's about to pan away, the like sheet falls away and there's nothing there. And like, it's one of those things where I'm like, I always wonder, and this is in Host, which is that uh, Zoom movie that came out this year. There's a, you wrote about there's one of those. I wrote about, yeah, like there's a, there's a, I love a, I love a sheet thrown on something that's not there and then it like disappears. <laughs> I think that's really scary. But there's also one part that I think is really disturbing and also really funny, which is that one of the little girls is friends with this demon. And the way they show that <laughs> is that she, they like have a, their room is like by the stairs on the second floor. And so what happens is there's a camera there and she jumps off the ledge and then like comes running back up and she does this over and over again. And then you realize that the, the demon is like catching her and then like sh shoving her back up the stairs and they're like playing with each other. And it's like, like a very classic Disney pet moment. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> it's like, it reminds me of that moment in Another underrated movie, I think, uh, Mama with Jessica Chastain. It's the uh, Guillermo del Toro produced movie um, wherein there's like a demon that's also playing with children. For some reason, that like is really scary to me. It's like, because <laughs> if inevitably it's like, you have to be on their good side and then something in the movie inevitably happens where they're no longer friends and the demon gets really, really scary. I feel like this um, kind of originates from the, the whole exorcist, Mr. Howdy relationship. And then kind of, per, I would say perfected in Poltergeist, a film that uh, one of our panelists uh, brought up, uh, Ryan brought up in the panel. Um, I love that. I love that that playfulness and that humor. Yeah, I feel like it's, it's, it's what makes me like, uh, 
David Sandberg, David F. Sandberg, he's the guy who did Lights Out and Annabelle Creation. Like, I like kids' movies a lot because they're really pr- playful. The scares are really well constructed. And I think a horror movie suffers when it takes itself too seriously. Um, it, it becomes something else and becomes uncomfortable in a different way. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would say Paranormal Activity 3 is certainly not the scariest movie I've seen, but it has some of the scariest moments. Um, I also, I love how yeah. when, because the vanishing was taken, you were like, okay, <laughs> well, we'll just go Paranormal Activity 3. <laughs> I mean, like, look, I, I, I think when it comes to like the scariest horror movies, like, like you guys were saying, it's like, it's so individual. Like I, oh, I have a really good friend who, yeah, I have, I have a friend who like does not find any supernatural stuff scary whatsoever. And they find like body horror and like invasion, mm-hmm. like home invasion movies really scary. And I don't, I don't think those movies are scary at all. Like, so I think it just depends on what you grew up with. I grew up Catholic. So like demons and possession and stuff is like really scary to me. So. <laughs> That's it's such just, a good point. And I also think uh, what you're describing is like the, the most, um, the broadest breakdown of an answer to this question. I do think there's like, two broad categories like do serial killers freak you out or do ghosts freak you out and like my <laughs> most scary thing is um gin do you know about G- dg dginn which is like this conception of supernatural creature in islamic culture and so because i grew up with that it freaks me out way more than anything else because a, a like belief system that I'd held at one time included this as a very real part of our world and as like an explanation for spooky things that happen and that like they look just like us and they might penetrate your day-to-day life and like I think that's the idea of like um of like a uh, insidious penetration and this like slow shift of your um of your of your real life situation is the thing that scares me most also in mentioning insidious i wanted to say i love that series a lot it's terrible but i love it and i also want to say shout out to patrick wilson for making the fifth insidious his directorial debut i think that is the classiest move of any actor turned director i've ever seen and i can't <laughs> wait it's probably not going to be good but like to either do something really dramatically like overt or to do the fifth movie in a, like a a horror franchise it's pretty cool anyway so it's, it's commitment and just and i and i and we should move on to beatrice because i'm dying to see if she chose <laughs> <the> activity three. <laughs> don't break the chain <laughs> um yeah i'm kind of embarrassed to admit my pick uh because i mean like horror was my gateway into cinema my mom really liked horror she like introduced me to you know, Michael Myers, Freddy Krueger. She literally took me to the theaters to see Thaw and the Descent when I was like still a little kid. Whoa. So like, you know, I was introduced to stuff that I like shouldn't have been watching as a small child, um, which desensitized me to some of the more graphic aspects of it. Oh. Um, <laughs> but strangely enough, despite having all this experience with like slashers and whatnot, what really devastated me as a kid uh, were alien invasion movies and specifically yeah. science. <laughs> which yeah. I'm kind of like embarrassed to admit because, you know, when uh, I, I think of signs, I think back to like an era in which Mel Gibson was like seen as a wholesome patriarch. Yeah. <laughs> and like, you know, the ending of signs is, you know, the characters triumph over the aliens and it's like linked to this religious message. It's like reaffirming one's faith which is just like a terrible ending, but like in my mind, it's like, even when I was a kid, it's like my mind glossed over that. And like, I I knew it was this sort of cinematic artifice ending and like that never really stayed with me. It never really gave me hope at the end of that movie. What really stuck with me was just this terrible dread that was building up throughout especially because we're not really given much to work with and we're kind of left to our imaginations of what could possibly be out in the cornfield. Um, but I mean, I have a phobia of 
aliens and like space and extraterrestrials like in general um especially aliens of the humanoid variety for whatever reason like the bug-like aliens don't do anything for me <laughs> even if they are uh, in better movies um but i don't know there's just something about like the vastness of space the like completely unknowable aspect of it and like how insignificant we are in the scope of it all that like makes me scared but then also just like makes me deeply uncomfortable um oh. and so like signs and i think the best alien invasions movies do this it, it, it's like they don't really convey you know a war between humans and aliens it's literally an invasion where we're completely powerless you know right. not just in terms of our resources and our weapons and our leaders but like also intellectually like we have no idea you know what these things are capable of like what they're here for just like being in this state of complete unknowability is absolutely terrifying for me and i think that like with signs, it does that really well because we're completely isolated in this farmhouse. You know, we're only given glimpses, silhouettes of aliens. We're given, you know, video footage from the outside world that, you know, we understand is also not dealing with this well at all. Like the reporters are nervous and everything. Meanwhile, dad is like in denial the whole time. Um, so I don't know, it's just, it's this very primordial fear for me um, that also like kind of links to an anxiety about, you know, my, my trying to find meaning in life and like it seeming so insignificant in the scope of, you know, these things that are so powerful that could just descend upon us and make us seem so small. Mm. I think it also kind of breaks the like two broad categories of horror theory too, because it marries both. It is both, um, it seems not totally unlikely that there's other intelligent life in the yeah. universe, but we don't <laughs> know it yet. So, you know, it's like bo both, it's like bodily and paranormal or sci-fi in a way. It's like a future we don't know yet. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And it's just I like to me, really they're the most about science, to Beatrice's mm -hmm. point. Sorry, say it again. Can I say something just really fast about science to Beatrice's point? Because I love that she picked it. One of the best things about horror movies is watching other people watch horror movies. And the most scared I have ever seen another person buy a movie is my high school friend, Maria Pia. We've been friends for 20 years, but I took her to see Signs in 2002. And not a date, but like very much like close pals going to see a movie. She spent two hours digging into my arm, watching the film, whispering, why am I at this movie? <laughs> <laughs> I want to leave this movie. And it was actually <laughs> acting because I was seeing it to write about it, but I couldn't stop watching her be terrified <laughs> by it. I don't know if other people have it. <laughs> scary movies are a fun thing to show friends or people watching during scary movies in theaters is really, really fascinating. And if I show horror movies, I'm like, are they going to be scared by this part? I've seen the movie, so I sometimes like look at the corner of my eye at them. Signs is the most terrified I've ever seen a movie make another person. Hmm. It, my experience I'll never forget that that was like 18 years <laughs> ago. I remember it just so vividly especially the alien on the roof at the beginning oh, yeah. she was like she was like I'm never going to forgive you for bringing me to this movie she was whispering this in the dark amidst like 900 people so, good I like signs is like one of my favorite kinds of horror movies because it doesn't cop out at the end like there's a different version of that movie where they're not aliens and it's like some other thing yeah and like by the end it's like oh no no it's aliens and like it's like really bad like it's like it's like really scary they're everywhere Beatrice yeah. have you seen I'm gonna be like the found footage apologist today but have you seen this movie called the fourth kind no I haven't it's okay so it's the concept is like the wildest concept I've heard for a found footage movie where it's it's a it's a found footage movie wherein it has reenactments of its own found footage in it like Ooh. actorly reenactments. So Mila Jovovich is in this movie, first of all. Oh, okay. I'm interested. It has like <laughs> it has it has bar like barn on one of the scariest parts of any movie I've ever seen. Like I there's some movies where it's like you remember a scene and you have to kind of watch the whole movie to get there to like really invest in it and be scared by it. But there's a scene that like it's 
that's part of it's like on a youtube compilation or whatever that every time i watch it I, like even if i haven't seen or remembered what the movie like even is about i watch that scene and i like still get really scared like it's <laughs> it's it really also, good it also begins with her actually introducing herself as mila jovovich to the audience yeah it's so i like i love found footage movies <laughs> that like are like yeah we get it like this is not real but then like part of you is like, okay, it's it's shot in this way that it's like, you can't help but for the really good ones, like to buy into it. And like, yes. that one is like, it, they're trying to make it look like a sort of like history channel, like made for TV mm -hmm. movie. And like the stuff in it is actually like really scary. So. I, I, want, I, I wanted to um, pick up and not not push back exactly, but counter this the idea of, um, you know, there are different kinds of ways of watching scary movies. And I love what we were all talking about, about or Adam, when you brought up seeing a movie in the theater with some with other people engaging their level of fear. And that is a certain, there's a, there's a real pleasure. That's that's the jolt and pleasure of a scary movie, right? Watching other people be scared. It's, it's enjoying their fear, making it, it feels contagious. It feels like a community. It feels like you're safer that way. But all of the truly scary moments that I've had, almost all, with the exception of the original Blair Witch Project, which was the scariest movie I ever saw in a theater with an audience. Oh. Mm -hmm. by that, speaking of found Taking footage. me back. Other than that, well, hey, it, we, we, we were part of that like pre-release group who started that freaking hype. It was after Sundance, but they showed this like early screening to us and we didn't really know what it was and we freaked out. I mean, yeah. we just, I guess, it's a documentary. <laughs> <laughs> but every other experience I've had where I've been truly scared, I've been by myself on the couch at home. And and it, it's almost like you have the theater and then you have the couch and then you get smaller and smaller with the laptop. And and the the, the most intimate, terrifying experience I've ever had watching a movie was because of you, Adam, who recommended this 1972 Spanish short, La Cabina. He recommended it to me because he wrote it, he wrote it for the Great Pumpkin series some years back. I still just went in expecting not much. It's 35 minutes, I believe, and Tommy Marchero film. It is, I think it, this is one of those examples of it just hit my particular buttons, feelings of helplessness mm. and um, confined spaces, perhaps. Um, this, it, I've talked about this movie before, so forgive me for those who've heard me go on and on and on about it, but I watched this on my laptop with headphones in my childhood bedroom. <laughs> it, it was like, you know, two in the morning. The world seemed like it got as small as that phone booth, which is where most of the movie is set. Um, I, this is a movie that functions on every kind of level. It's aesthetically interesting. It's politically interesting but the way that it just keeps on um, um, revealing new layers of helplessness and just inexorably, I've never experienced anything like that. And it probably would only work in a short film format too. And there's something mm -hmm. very specifically mm -hmm. frightening about short work, short stories, short, uh, short films. So La Cabina, for anyone who dares want to watch it, it's on YouTube. It seems like when you first watch it, you start, you'll think it's like a Jacques Tati film, like, oh, what's this adorable mm -hmm. movie about a guy in a phone booth? Just keep going. I love yeah, I you bringing up duration as it. a factor. Sorry, go ahead, Ina. So, uh, I was saying when he, uh, when you talked about it before, Michael, I remember going and looking for it. And I think it actually scared me so much that I kind of blacked it out. <laughs> so, um, but it's a, yeah, I, it really I agree with all of that. I don't know if I'm going to revisit it right now, though. When I wrote about it for Michael, it was that I remembered watching the second half on TV as like a kid kid on TV on something called TLN, which is like oh, a no. network in, in Toronto, obviously. And I had to go back and find it on Google. I wrote about all this to see the whole movie. So I didn't even know why the guy was in the phone booth, those weird crowd scenes with the soccer ball and everything else. Mm -hmm. But watching it again, I thought this is something I remember being very scary. <coughs> It'll be one of those things that when re-encountered is kind of not because that's another fun thing is looking at the things that made you scared when you were younger and feeling like oh I'm past that mm -hmm. like this was the opposite of even knowing where it went it was so weird to see something where I'd seen the ending but not the beginning and the beginning's not particularly scary it's just kind of uncanny but then as it's kind of going along I was like this is working on me all over again and even more so even even worse I hope people who are watching this seek it out on YouTube because it's a good way to spend 30 good way to spend 30 minutes
<laughs> well, and what you're bringing up, Adam, is something that Nicholas mentioned a couple of times, which is the idea of contrast being a major factor in like effective scare that like it needs a goofy element or it needs a, a playful element or something because it makes the moments that um, the shift like is kind of scary when you think you're safe and you're not is a particular special kind of scare. Well, also like, and do you, do you want to share that scare? I, I always ask myself things like that when I, so my husband who's watching um, is not as into horror movies as I am. And I'm, I've often kind of sat him down and forced him to watch some horror movies. And sometimes he's appreciative and often he's not. Like last night we watched Hellraiser. He had never seen Hellraiser before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's so, because it's so disgusting. Yeah, but, but it's also yeah. sexy. It was so good, yeah. Sure, yeah, it sort of is. But then like La Cabina, I've never shown him and I've never, sh and The Vanishing, I've, I've never shown him. And there, there is a similar thread of the fear that connects those two films. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just, he just chimed in. I'm not <laughs> going to show him The Vanishing. I, I decided years ago, I said, I'm not watching that with you. I don't want him so to. What you know, one of our viewers mentioned that they don't find the vanishing scary at all, and um, I think what is scary about it, it about the vanishing, sorry to like come back to it, but is that what's scary is a potential reflection of what is flawed or dark in yourself, and I think that that is difficult to share with someone and to even admit in front of them while watching that, like, yes, I have this moment that I think most people have but never talk about where you stand at the edge of something and think, what is the impulse that keeps me from jumping and what is the impulse that keeps me from not jumping? And I think that like horror that engages with something that's so personal, you don't even wanna talk about it or it's, it's not until you're much older that, you're, that you understand other people share that feeling is it stays with you. Yeah, and, and, and question generally for, for the panel, like are there things that you were terrified of young that you have either overcome or revisited and found that it's even worse? A question Michael posed recently while we uh, virtually together watched The Witches. Like, <laughs> does it dissipate that childhood fear? Does it stay with you for with certain films? I mean, I'm scarred for life by, it's a dumb movie. Um, does anyone remember Arachnophobia? Oh, okay. I think that movie's so yeah, scary. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's like, it's it's, it has stuck around, Arachnophobia. <laughs> I, am the, I was not afraid of spiders before seeing that film. <laughs> it really changed the course of my entire life because now if I see a spider in the apartment, I run screaming in terror. And it's amazing that it had that power. I saw it a couple of times in the movie theater near me as a kid where I grew up. And um, yeah, I just, it's like, I don't understand why it, some of the spiders aren't even that scary. It's not, it's not the big spider that scares me the most. It's all of the little ones especially at the end is they're all kind of like dropping from the ceiling and there are spiders everywhere. There's something about it is the idea that they can be, they can be everywhere and unseen and all around you and then just kind of pop out. I just, I'm, uh, I'm freaking myself out talking about it in the dark. I have, I have one that it, it's not a horror movie, but I think a lot of kids will, or people who grew up with this movie will agree. The truck driver part from Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Yes. <laughs> that like lives in my mind like all the time. I rewatched it recently just to be like, whatever. It's still fucking terrifying. Um, also, Pee Wee as a person is like really weird and like, and it was like one of those things where even as a kid, I don't know if you like, I'm sure everyone's experienced this to some degree. Like when you're a kid and you're watching stuff that's meant for kids, some of it like is still like, it, like, breaches past the layer and you're like this is weird yeah. right like <laughs> like I thought that was like when Teletubbies were around I was like this is a weird show oh. and I was like I was it's like three to make you think that <laughs> but then I like I I remember watching that and it was like uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure and it was like on at night or something and I was like half asleep and that part came on and I like started crying I was like Jesus anyway <laughs> So I think about that all large the time. Large Marge. Yeah, Large Marge, exactly. Oh, God. Adam, has anyone here seen The S from Hell? Does anyone know what that is? So Rodney Asher, who made Room 237 and later on made The Nightmare, which is the Ooh. sleep paralysis documentary. Mm -hmm. 
that I, <laughs> I like Rodney a lot, but his short is my favorite thing he ever made, which is a seven minute short doc about people who grew up watching the Nelvana logo after the Jetsons who believed it was demonically haunted. Oh my and this God. Is not, and this is not like one person. This is a very much online forum community thing. It's like a creepy pasta, but real, where he went on the internet. It's very different than finding five people who think the shining is like a metaphor for, you know, the Holocaust. <laughs> it's like finding people who are like, yeah, that logo came on. And I actually thought that the television was trying to kill me. And he went and found five or six people who don't know each other, who grew up in different places, but who all had this same childhood experience. And the movie is just amazing because similar to Room 237 and the sleep paralysis and the nightmare, it's like, where do these shared terrors come from? Because uh, it's not a scary uh, thing. It's a little bumper. It's like an S and a synthesizer noise. <clears throat> but these people grew up as kids just terrified of it and they have a hard time revisiting it or even thinking about it and the implications of the movie in terms of what we find collectively and individually scary is just fascinating which i think all rodney's movies are about but if you like room 237 s from hell is incredible and it's easy you can find it on on vimeo it's not a scary movie but as a movie about things that people find scary it, it yeah really that reminds me um uh, I wanted to talk about Kill List, which is my like a, a, of a more recent horror film that just like really stuck with me um, yeah. as one of the scariest, one of the mo like most got under my skin. Think about it all the time, and maybe because it's it is also I think a marriage of supernatural and real world terror, and it and it um, uh, sort of plays with that instrument so deftly. So the entire beginning of the film, the only like terror to be had is from the perspective, you know, from a child's perspective, hearing your parents argue, like a constantly discordant domestic situation creates a constant feeling of, of no safety, no peace, um, uh, which then, you know, de de devolves uh, into other kinds of activity. And I think it, it brings up a few things that we've mentioned, one of which is like, the one moment, the one moment that sticks with you. There's a moment of violence, not at the end of the film, but early on in the film. And I interviewed uh, Ben Wheatley at the time and he talked about, I think he mentioned the orphanage as the inspiration for that. And the idea that if you do something up front that's just so extreme, the audience remains on edge throughout the rest of the film thinking like, well, this person could do anything to me and you don't have, and then you don't, and then you don't have to do anything else. It just bears the, the shade of that, um, that one experience. But what made me think about what you're talking about, Adam, is I remember asking him, why do we all find it terrifying to see a horde of naked adults? There's a scene in the movie where the, you know, sort of main character suddenly finds himself being chased through the woods by this cult, uh, these cult figures. And it's just a lot. It's just like, I don't know, like 30 naked adults chasing him through the woods, which like the, the like, comedy horror line of that is so thin it can change on a dime and it's it's he, a trope it's a horror movie trope even though theoretically like we've all seen ourselves naked <laughs> like what are we so scared of this is a, like this is a question people are asking him in a different way based on rebecca but when i met ben the first thing i said is what's wrong with you <laughs> but said, what is wrong with you because the last 20 minutes of kill list and michael wrote beautifully about this i mean wheatley's a divisive filmmaker but kill is the best thing he has or ever will make yeah. and those last 20 minutes are so upsetting they're just so beyond upsetting. upsetting and i said it like where the where the hell did that come from and he said it was a childhood nightmare and he doesn't know where it came from he said that he used to dream when he was a kid that there were a bunch of naked people in the woods and that they started chasing him and he said this in a bunch of interviews and he doesn't know where it's from but he definitely put it on screen okay that's funny because the other th thing he told me when i asked about it is that he went to a y2k party where like one person got too lit and was like time to get naked and everybody else said no thanks and then they did and he like retained this memory of the aggression of somebody else being naked when it was not like the social socially agreed upon moment or whatever, like having to confront this per this person's adult nudity in an unexpected setting without consent. That's one of my, one of my good well, friends. That... When we saw Hereditary, 
the part at the end there's a guy that's like naked in the closet like he thinks about that all the time and it freaks him out like he he thinks that's so scary and i and i remember seeing it with him and laughing and he was like that's not funny like that's really scary and i was like why and he's like i i can't (laughs) tell you but it's really scary i was like okay yeah so i feel like (laughs) this is like a very validating conversation for him because it's like it is like a weird thing that now that you guys are talking about it, like a lot of naked adults are in horror movies for like like no reason. Blue, Blue Velvet, I like. Blue Velvet was one of my uh, scariest ones on the list that I was thinking of. And it has that scene that terrified me. I was living in the suburbs where Isabella Rossellini is standing outside naked. Yeah. Uh, in the, and in front of the car. And, and then there's Laura Dern's strange reaction to her that's borders on funny but that nightmarish image of someone being you know it's like where did she come from why is she there then she's in the in like the vestibule of the house there's a cut and then she's inside and it's and the family is reacting so strangely I think I found that really terrifying um and just would worry about looking out the window and just seeing somebody you know in a state that you're kind of like, why are they out there? What, you know, that it's just so wrong or off. Mm. Um, Things that are slightly off are are probably what had screwed me up the most as a kid. But we have a, we have a question from a viewer for everybody. Um, I remember being terrified of the way that Mark Hamill screamed in Empire. (laughs) It made me wonder any unintentionally are there any unintentionally scary moments of horror that stick with you in your youth or otherwise? Does anybody have an answer for that one? You know, that was the way that Mark Hamill screamed in Empire and Jedi. Oh, <laughs> I had to repeat myself. I had to repeat for Ina because I laughed so hard. <laughs> I've, I've got one easily. Okay, so I grew up watching three things until I was like five, which is, it was Blue's Clues, Titanic and Moulin Rouge like those are the three things I watched like over and over again there's a part at the beginning of the can can scene in in Moulin Rouge that's like in slow motion and there's a guy dressed there's a guy dressed up as a clown Uh that one guy I think about him all the time I'm not scared of clowns like at all but that one guy like I kept me up at night so like yeah that I hate that I hate that anyone else there's a lot of like grotesquerie in Moulin Rouge that I don't think is intentional. <laughs> I can't think of anything myself, though I know I was constantly freaked out by abnormal things as a child. Well, a movie that I don't find scary now, because again, I'm not particularly frightened by real world serial killer violence st- stuff, but um, <laughs> When I was eight, my babysitter let me and my little sister watch Silence of the Lambs. And she went, whatever, don't tell your mom. And I remembered recently that she was our pediatrician's daughter. So it's kind of messed up. And there were, it's, I think like that makes me think about how particularly as a young person, like you're responding to the world in such Um, an emotional way that it's like this I didn't understand if I think if I understood the story I'd just be like oh this is dumb and kind of offensive but because I didn't it was more powerful to me at that age because it was like a series of disturbing images that stayed with me for years like I had to sleep with the light on for like a month because I just remembered you know like loose skin quilt and like <laughs> this, Serena, what I now know is I just don't understand so <laughs> I'm, not I I'm not saying it was unintentional just to hit me differently at that time I had a question for Beatrice based on the alien thing and also movies that people don't necessarily think of as horror movies I found E.T. very scary as a kid <laughs> based on the alien thing I don't know if you I don't know if you felt the same way I actually have never felt that much towards E.T. Um, something about the, I don't know, movie, even as a kid, movies like about other kids ganging together and like the pseudo inspirational thing, I've just never even been attracted to. I was a weird kid. But um, <laughs> uh, a movie that was supposed to be funny that I saw as a kid that, I mean, I think is still kind of scary, but anyways, 
also about aliens is Mars Attack, which <laughs> I saw oh, Mars Attacks. also <laughs> as a child. Um, <laughs> and, you know, my mom you know, introduced it to me thinking it was also going to be funny to me since I was so tough back then. Um, and I was pretty horrified at just like the banality of how evil they were, like how they yeah. are completely emotionless and like the speed with which the bodies just kind of disintegrated that, you know, that was a pretty terrifying movie for me. And I mean, I guess a little less so nowadays, but like still the like concept behind it is uh, disturbing. Well, I, th I think, I think um tim burton up up until around that time had that i think capability that a lot of other filmmakers didn't it's one of the things he did really really well i think was to make entertainments that were appealing in various ways but actually could turn that corner at any moment and be kind of terrifying for some reason i mean obviously you know Pee Wee is is, is a perfect example of that <laughs> yeah, yeah and like the absurdity of the solution i think the aliens yeah. ultimately they like their heads explode because they hear like this country song, which is just right. like, <laughs> that's clearly artifice. Like the aliens would be invading us because that's not how they're gonna die. <laughs> uh, even though we are coming up on the hour, we have another question, which is a general one for everybody. What's the best jump scare that you can recall? Ooh. I'll go think... first. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> because mine is really out of the blue and I, I don't even know if it's a movie that um, a lot of people have seen. Have, I'll ask. It's a 1988 British movie called Paper House, directed by yes. Bernard Rose. Yes. It's <laughs> really <laughs> a great, great movie. Um, I think you'll like this one, Beatrice, because it's the, the girl does not have friends. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, and so she enters this dream world uh, based on this drawing that she does. But there, but she's also kind of scared of her father. She has sort of an absent father and he, he shows up in her dreams very terrifyingly at one point. But then there's one tiny, tiny moment where she's dreaming of taking a photograph of her father at the beach, like she's with the family and it seems like it's a happy memory. And he just all of a sudden moves really fast toward the camera and she wakes up. That scares me so terribly. Do you remember that, Adam? You remember that moment? That moment is so inexplicably terrifying. Absolutely. It's absolutely terrifying. And Bernard Rose is a good horror director because Candyman is quite good. And when you yeah. rewatch it, not just rich and like dense and fertile, but like quite scary with some good jump scares. And for the jump scare thing, all I was going to say, I did this piece for The Ringer two years ago on like the history of the jump scare in different ways that they oh. work. Whatever else you say about Adrian Lynn and what or Lion or, or some of the movies he's made, Jacob's Ladder's got two or three of the best built staged out of nowhere little jump scares especially the tilt to the guy with his head going crazy in the mirror which is a nod to repulsion like it's doing the polanski jump scare but instead of just a silhouette it's also a guy whose head is sort of shaking all around crazy frame rate like a nine inch nails video but it comes absolutely out of nowhere about three quarters of the way through the movie in an otherwise kind of calm scene like a real, a real, a real uh, high watermark, I think, for jump scares in an American studio horror movie. It's really scary. I'm, I'm so glad you brought up Candyman in general, and I'm surprised we hadn't until up until this point because I just remembered that that's the only like dumb thing that someone can still automatically scare me with. Like if you start to say Candyman, I will say, <laughs> "Don't say that again. <laughs> Don't say it again." Racism is real, so. <laughs> I'm not sure if this qualifies as a jump scare, but just like in terms of something appearing very suddenly in like a single shot, uh, Mulholland Drive. Yeah, and, I was gonna say, yeah. Yeah, yeah just, you know. Yeah. Are we talking about the, the behind, behind the, the Yeah, I didn't even clarify. I just assumed everyone <laughs> was talking about <laughs> Yes, when the monster thing comes out from behind the trash can. So so terrifying. Terrifying. Was it anyone else as terrified of me as that moment to come back to Shyamalan for a second and I'm <laughs> letting you up signs because it reminds me of like <laughs> he, can be, he can be a very scary filmmaker but um in the sixth sense when um Haley Jawsman goes into the kitchen and there's the woman in the kitchen in the bathrobe and then she just turns around and she reveals her wrists and starts yelling at him as if he was the husband yeah. There's a, 
to me is just like, uh, I, some, there's like an intensity to it. You've seen her in the room, you know she's there. It's not like she comes out of nowhere, but like her presentation as she turns around to, to him and the camera, I think is just like, it's one of the most intense scaring things I, I can think about. Great mention from Luke there at the very end of Vertigo. <laughs> I think that that's absolutely true. I think that last, the, the last moment of Vertigo with this, the, 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 the figure of the nun arising from the tower is absolutely one of the scariest things I've ever seen in a movie. Well, 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 nuns are scary. Nuns are scary. We know that. What was it? Um, while we're on Hitchcock, mine is actually Rear Window. I think the Raymond Burr looking at the camera in Rear Window absolutely <laughs> destroys me every single time. Great. Freaks me out. That's great. And the movie that I was going to talk about, actually, so I'm sorry I, I grabbed someone's film, but was is Dead of Night. And oh. I feel like the um, the finale of the of the frame story is completely terrifying and continues to be scary. And just the notion that you are, you know, of um, premonition or nightmare or repetition um, is totally, <laughs> it's totally frightening. It's like feeling like, you know, I've been here before and I'm kind of having that feeling right now. So, <laughs> when, yeah, when the whole thing loops back around, I find that also kind of, I can't define why it's so terrifying, but it's so, so it's, it's not as scary, as scary as the ventriloquist segment, actually, in that film. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think all of the, the fact that all the different story strands come together um, and that, you know, and that maybe all of us are somebody else's dream or nightmare is, <laughs> is discomforting, to say the least. There's a... There's a great, it's like the only good part of the first Annabelle movie <laughs> um, <laughs> is there's like one truly fantastic jump scare where it's like a woman is in one room and then across the hall is another room and she sees a little girl there and the room to the door starts closing on its own and the little girl, little girl starts running at the door and then the door's almost closed and then instead of the little girl bursting through, it's like a full grown woman with like a knife that like busts into the room. And it's all, <laughs> it's, it's all in the same shot and it's so scary. And like, and then the movie, the rest of the movie isn't. But like that one moment is like, it's so well constructed. I, I like, I like jump scares that can happen in the same shot. And I feel like the like sort of, like James Wan like likes to do that. Like, especially in the first Insidious, there's that one part where like they're in the bedroom and they see a guy who's like walking outside their bedroom. Oh, that's that's uh, incredible. And yeah. like he's he's walking back and forth, walking back and forth. And then when he gets to one side, he walks back and he's inside the room. Like, that's that's one of the great that's one of the great jump scares. And I and I did want to say earlier, it's it, you know, we that when you brought up Insidious, you were also kind of slagging on it, understandably, but Insidious is absolutely terrifying. Oh, it's a scary, it's a really scary movie, but the parts in between those parts are so stupid. That yeah, is like, oh. movie, it's like, so <laughs> I, yeah. I, I kind of like made fun of Sinister. I don't think it's the scariest movie of all time. Sorry, Forbes, but I also <laughs> think it's actually, it has good jump scares, but it also has that like you need some seed of like, oh God, I see something of real life in this. And there's that like, you know, the idea that maybe he is a really bad parent or something that sort of underpins um, the horror and it works, you know, there are like contemporary and somewhat silly horror movies that work all the better because of the, their, I don't know, tonal shifts. To Nicholas's point about Patrick Wilson, have people here seen Conjuring 2? Yeah. It's one of the greatest moments ever when Patrick Wilson walks into the room and totally no sells Vera Farmiga's terrifying portrait of the nun. Where he's like, honey, what are you working on? And she's just a <laughs> full size portrait of that horrifying <laughs> nun who ended up getting her own movie. And he's like, oh, that's nice. Like the nun later in the movie, actually in a movie theater, people were losing their minds when the nun is sort of going in and out of the room in the painting frame and the shadows. I remember the audience I saw that movie with being horrified, but Wilson just walking in the room and being like, oh, honey, you've made like a six foot tall drawing of a demonic nut. And then just kind of turning to something else, just un un unforgettable. I think we're going to, sadly, I think we're going to have to wrap things up because we're almost at 610. But since um, 
you know, I'm one of the hosts, I'm gonna cheat a little bit and I'm, <laughs> I'm going to take advantage of my status and mention one more jump scare because I think it's not talked about enough as a jump scare. And I think the fact that it's in a 1945 prestige Hollywood movie makes it all the more interesting. And a slight little plug, Freya and I um, have collaborated on a series coming up in November for Criterion Channel. It's called Queer Fear. It's the latest edition of Queer Side of the series that I curate for the Criterion Channel. So it's all horror stuff with a queer tinge. And it's about everything I care about in life. <laughs> everything you care about. And so you get to see a conversation with, um, between myself and Freya. One of the films in the series is The Picture of Dorian Gray which is the 1945 mm -hmm. Albert Lewin adaptation of the Oscar Wilde book, which I think is just one of the great films. I think that the shot cut to the painting from black and white to Technicolor to that the hideous phase of the Asian <laughs> model yeah. painting, one of the great shot cuts in movie history. Yeah. And the rendering of the painting, everything about it, it's so oh perfectly <laughs> done. The, the, it's suddenly textured. It's like the scream on steroids come to life. <laughs> and it's such, a, it's such a subdued film. Like it's such a calm, placid film with a very um, mannered performance style. Mm -hmm. Everyone talks in a very calm tone. Everything happens in a very kind of quiet black and white. And then suddenly this thing bursts. So not a spoiler, yeah. but <laughs> I should shut up now. I think we should <laughs> toast the jump scare. Love it or hate it, it's a important part of all of our lives. <laughs> and I don't know if anyone's seen my number. Okay. I want to shout out to the reverse shouters out there that joined us today Ryan Swin, Chris Wisniewski, Devika Girish, Edo Choi, James Wem, Justin Stewart, Chloe Lazat, and Julian Allen. Oh, thank you all for coming. That's so sweet. Cheers. Have a happy Halloween, everybody. And thank you all for being here to our wonderful guests. Thanks for having us. Thank you. <laughs>